welcome to the stage, the Randomat Crew. Thank you. What an introduction. Whoa, look at this crowd. This Great crowd. crowd. Some of you might not have heard of us, but we are the Roundabout Crew, as mentioned in the voiceover just there. Uh, and hello and welcome to everyone to the first ever VidCon Australia Creator Keynote. It's the Red Club. All right. So my name's Elliot. I'm Tom. And I'm Kenny. And we're the Roundabout Crew. We're an Australian sketch comedy group. Uh, we weren't based in Canberra, but then we realised how crap it is, and we moved to Sydney. Very cold. If there's anyone in Canberra, here you can relate. You won't get offended. Um, so VidCon put on the Creator Keynote specifically for people who are looking to create online video. Whether you're just starting or an experienced content creator, we hope that you can find information, insights, and inspiration in the stories presented to you. Dude, so, you that. That thanks, right, yeah, that was, <laughs> there, you read that, that was the first time I read it, too. <laughs> so let's get things underway, because no one wants to see us through the stage. So, first on our list, uh, she is the producer of the Snapchatter of the Year Woman in Tech Shorty Award. She's a storyteller strategist, specialising in micro video content. Did someone write tongue twisters on here deliberately, or...? <laughs> It's a stitch up. It's a stitch up. <laughs> Please welcome String You In! Woo! <laughs> wow, that was funny. Hi everyone. I'm from. Where's the slide? I think they want me to dance. <laughs> Slide's not working. Alright, cool. So I'm um, from the future. I just, four days ago, I was in San Francisco, and the great thing about being in Australia is that we're 18 hours ahead of San Francisco. So everyone here is a futurist. Remember that. So that's, that's amazing, right? Um, so in the last four months, I've been traveling around the world, visited over three continents, um, visited over 20 cities, including San Francisco, New York, and to organize fried chicken parties. So if you had to know anything about me, I love fried chicken. <laughs> and I started uh, about three, two, three years ago, my journey about video started on Meerkat. And Meerkat died in six months. But within that six months, I was able to gain 44,000 followers, um, gain like a community of people around me. And one of the reasons why I went to San Francisco is to meet that community itself. Like I was able, like you know, to live in the most expensive city on top of, of you know, CBD area of a one million dollar house because of New Cat. So even if platform dies, just remember you could have the skill sets, that all everything that you learn on New Cat or on dying platforms or any video platforms, you could like transfer it over to the next platform. Which brings to this. So in the last two three years, I've gone and experimented on all of these platforms. And I won, uh, like last year, uh, beginning of this year, I went to the Shorty, uh, the Shorty Awards and won the best Snapchat channel called Women in Tech. And now I'm going to talk about the latest video platform. Uh, LinkedIn is the new Facebook for business people. And they just released videos uh, like about three weeks ago, and I happen to have early, super early access. And you know, just be like this grandma, don't be dry as fuck. And within three weeks, I was able to grow from 900 followers to 2,700 people. So remember, like, there are 500 million business people on LinkedIn. And within like three weeks, I was able to gain like 280,000 views of traffic, organic traffic. My first video that I went on, um, that I uplo uploaded natively on LinkedIn gained 100,000 views. And I was able to like have consultations and everything like that. So creating content on video, like especially because you guys have an unfair advantage, you know how to create awesome content. So you should jump up on LinkedIn and start building up your own channel on there. So I'm giving you like three months, four months ahead of like being part of the game. So if you open up and download LinkedIn app and see a video camera, you you pretty much could start creating videos right now and pretty much have like a you create your own channels. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to like slay on LinkedIn and able to like monetize your content straight away because as content creators, you deserve to have every money that comes your way. So uh, first tip, create traffic with relevant content. Provide insights and trends, personal development stories, share and document your creative process. 
So what I've done is I'm planning to be the first YouTube live channel <coughs> on LinkedIn because no one is creating videos on a daily basis. And if you people like you know duplicate what you did on YouTube, I'm pr pretty much sure that you guys will have a lot of success as well. Two, uh, be there daily, create daily content, be super engaged, connect with your tribe. The thing about videos is, is like you pull the people that you want to connect with. Three, think and grow like a business. You, you have to survive. You have to have, a, um, you know, you have to have respect for your skills as a videographer, as a YouTuber, as a storyteller. And remember cash flow is king because you need to eat and survive as well. And you know, doing things for free is okay at the beginning, but don't do that forever. And, you know, and use LinkedIn as an opportunity to connect with other business mentors as well. And here's a little, like, um, if you want the fourth tip, I will love it if you go onto LinkedIn and connect with me and message me directly, drop a fried chicken, and I'll give you the fourth tip. I'm serious, I'll give you a fourth tip. So if you do that and give me a fried chicken emoji, I pretty much will uh, we'll give you the, the fourth tip. And tomorrow I'm going to have a workshop too to create bite-sized content. If you're interested, I love it if you join me. Uh, and that's about it, everyone. So I'll see you on LinkedIn. <laughs>
making content or um, truly expressing the best version of yourself, it's, it comes across as like fake and people see that and um, I feel like that's like one of the, the top things if you want to create content, it's just to stick to who you are and um, yeah, do what you truly like to do because otherwise there's no point to creating if you're not actually enjoying it and um, I feel like with YouTube and everything online, it gives such a big outlet for creative people to do anything that they want to do. And um, yeah, that's basically um, why I love YouTube so much. I just feel like I keep saying YouTube, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like plug YouTube as much as possible. I just feel so grateful that I get to do this. I just still am so shocked that they want me to do this because I'm like, I'm such an awkward little bee. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> But I guess I guess I can gain something. I hope I hope like at least one person in this like gain something from what I just said. But yeah, um, like being authentic online is like very important, and it should be for everybody. Um, because you shouldn't just be authentic online. You should be authentic in every single thing that you do in your life. Because like you can post pictures, filters, all that kind of stuff like that. That's what you do when you leave the house, what truly matters. Because like you can turn your phone off, you do all that kind of stuff at the end of the day. And um, yeah, it's what you, your influence in real life that really makes an impact. And, um, and it's cool that we can make that impact um, online too. Because it gets the best of both worlds to be able to impact people online. And, um, try to do it in real life as well, which is, which is cool. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of VidCon. I've got two panels tomorrow. I've got one about being like out online with some really cool people on that panel, and I've got one about mental health, which is going to be a good little chat as well. So yeah, enjoy your VidCon, and hopefully I like meet some of you if you want to chat. I'm approachable, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So, Hank Green, everybody. My staircase, you can't use it. You just have to jump down. It's mine. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy, so happy to be here. It's wonderful. This first day has been so great already, and, uh, and even the first two days before the event started, I've had a really great time in the city. And I've uh, talked to a lot of creators, had a lot of really interesting thoughts, and uh, really gotten my mind juices going, which is all I really want in life. So, um, I, uh, yeah, this is, and it's just really wonderful to see this room full of smart, passionate people who are into this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like when we first decided we were going to do an event in Australia, it was a big thing to chew off for us, and that it was pretty scary. And in the end, we decided to do it, and it was a risk, and you have made that risk super worthwhile. Thank you for having faith in us. It's really wonderful. <laughs> so, I went to uh, an event yesterday that YouTube put on for advertisers and brands called the Brandcast Preview. Actual Brandcast is happening in the city, of course. Um, Somebody said to me yesterday, Sydney's like a blockbuster movie and Melbourne's like a good book. <laughs> um, I don't really know what that means, I've never been to Sydney. Um, so at that event, I, I uh, got up in front of a bunch of advertisers and the, and the message that I wanted to send to them, which I did it in a different way than this, 
was like, what are you saying? Like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What, why? Why are you like letting us build a future without you? Please come help build up the creators of tomorrow. See that as legitimate, uh, because otherwise we're just gonna figure this out and you're not gonna be a part of it. Um, yeah, what are you thinking? Was the thing that I kept thinking as I was writing my talk. Like, what, what's going through your old heads? Sorry, they're mostly younger than me. I'm old now. Um, but now, like, uh, uh, having had a bunch of conversations, thinking about what I'm going to talk about on the stage, I sort of started to feel like, boy, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. Because also, what am I thinking? Why are we doing this? This is a really weird, hard thing to be putting so much creative energy into. Uh, and also, how do we even think that we can take on, like, media, this giant, epic, huge thing, that we can be a part of that? Uh, and maybe that's one good reason to do it, just because it maybe seems like you can't. But basically this talk is about what, like what, why, why, why are we doing this? Because I don't know that we check into it enough. And I think that that's a really important thing to be thinking about. Um, so I, like, as creators, like the number one thing for us, I think, is thinking like, why do people like stuff? How do I create something that people are gonna laugh at or that are gonna inspire them or feel like it's helping them through something or it's relatable or whatever it is. Um, how do we make people do stuff with our content, whether that's just laugh, or whether it's subscribe, or whether it's become part of our communities. Uh, so that's really important. And it's also sort of the same thing as saying, like, why do I like stuff? Um, so when people say to me, well, I just create content that I like, it's the same thing, it's the same thing. Like, no one knows what other people actually like. We, we only have the experience of one human being, uh, so we're just applying what we think is good to other people. Uh, so yeah, like pretty much if you're making stuff for yourself, there are other people like you. It doesn't matter how weird you are. Weird is apparently very good if you're how to basic, like you could just be very strange. Like there's nothing weirder than that and it is very popular. So like you can't, you can't be too weird to make content for someone else. Uh, yeah, I actually like that. I didn't mean to say that, but it sounded really good. Um, I didn't write it down first, so. Uh, yeah, so, but understanding why you like something is not the same thing as understanding why you like making something. And that is the other, I think, less talked about key to, like, finding both success and also kind of happiness and satisfaction, and some people are like, never be satisfied, and yeah, okay, there's a good fuel behind that, but also, oh God, being satisfied would be so great, right? Please, be satisfied. That's like, like, different people have different goals, but like, I'm really, I would love satisfaction. Uh, and I can't get none. Um, so, uh, so it's a separate question, and do we ask it enough? I'm not sure that we do, because there are good reasons, and I think there are, are bad reasons why we create stuff. And I wrote some down. These are just thought starters. They are not the only reasons why we do things, but there are good ones. Like, you know, AJ was just talking about helping people feel comfortable in themselves and helping you feel comfortable in yourself. The joy of just making stuff, because you love doing it, you love dedicating yourself and, and sitting in a chair for a long time and your brain is stuck on this one thing and you're doing it and at the end you've done it and it, that's a wonderful feeling. Um, feeling like you're part of something bigger than you. That's great, I love that. Feeling like you're making someone else happy, making them smile building a community, all good reasons, not the only good reasons. There are also sort of like maybe not great reasons, and I'm not saying like these are terrible and you're a bad person if this is part of why you create or part of why I create. Uh, winning, getting ahead of other people, regardless of whether you even like them or not, just winning, climbing up the mountain that doesn't have a top. Not necessarily a good motivation, but certainly one for me sometimes and for a lot of people. Narcissism, I want people to look at me because I think that I'm special. Um, it's there, and I try to look it right in the face, and I say, like, hey, that's there. I don't want to ignore it. I want to be aware of the bad reasons why I create. Um, because your self-worth is tied to the number of Instagram likes you get. Like, that's a bad reason to make stuff, but it's a reason that a lot of people make stuff. You don't know if you don't check. You don't know why you're making things unless, until you check in. Time limit exceeded. Ha! I run this conference. <laughs> I've only got like four betas left, it's fine. Um, 
So, uh, and, and I will say, like, after, after 11 years of doing this, first I'll say, if you're motivated by bad things, sometimes you do bad things. Uh, I, I'm not, like, bad motivations can be good to get you someplace. Any fuel will get you somewhere, and that's okay. Like, as long as you're aware of them. But it's when a bad fuel is making you do a bad thing to get to a place where you're going that I start to be questioned about it. Like, bad fuel isn't necessarily stuff you shouldn't use. Like, you want to use everything you got as long as it's not making you do a bad thing. So, uh, it's just good to look at it. So after 11 years in this, uh, 11 years doing this, I, I will say that success in creation, like feeling of like the feeling of success, because success, of course, is not something that exists outside of you. It only exists in the way that you feel it. Success in creation isn't always tied with the size of your audience. Even economically, it's not always tied with the size of your audience. It's tied to the amount of value you deliver to your audience. It's tied to the kind of audience you have. It's even tied to simple things that you can't have a hard time controlling like how much money your audience has. Uh, but it is also, of course, controlled by the size of your audience. That's just not the only thing that uh, controls like your economic success, and it's certainly not the only thing that, con that controls the success that you feel inside of you. The feeling of like, I've done a good thing. So I don't know why you're here in this room. I don't know what you do. I don't know the details. I'm not very good at like, the details of how to like, succeed on YouTube anymore because I did that 10 years ago, and the world is very, very different now. Um, but I do think that I want to ask you to take a look at it, to like think about, like, I do think that the, the thinking about like what you, why you are doing this, like part of success is asking that question. Um, so and I think that like no shame, ask it and answer it as honestly as you can. Um, is it to make an impression? Is it to make money? Is it influence? Is it attention? Is it changing the world? Is it joy? Like all of these things, don't be, don't turn away from them. Don't be afraid of them. And if you don't like what you're fine, but like what you find, be okay with changing up what you're doing and how you're doing it. And if that feels like, like I don't want to do that, it feels like I've been working for so long to do this thing, and I've dedicated so much of my life to it. And if, if that was all wrong, then I wasted all that time. No. You did it. Two reasons. One, anytime you're creating, you are succeeding in a way. You are making stuff. And that is wonderful in itself. You're growing as a person. You're making stuff for people. Uh, and second, like if you're doing something that ultimately isn't servicing uh, the good parts of you or it isn't servicing actually what you want to get done, you want to stop now. Like it's, it's bad to do that for a year. It's worse to do that for two years. Like Just because you've been acting unhealthy is not a good reason to keep acting unhealthy. Um, though I do love Tim Tams. Uh, so, uh, but I will say the motivations are really hard to figure out. This isn't something that's easy to do. Looking at yourself and figuring out who, what drives you, it's taken me a long time to, to do that. Um, but I will say, I, I, I try to do it regularly. Like, it's a good thing to do, like, on the first of the month, be like, why am I doing all the things I'm doing? Let's just check for half an hour. Just think about that. Maybe have conversations with, that, with people that you love. Um, and I would like to ask you all to do a thing, which is to, to maybe sometime when you get a free moment at this event, I know there aren't, aren't a lot of those, to write it down. Uh, it's not going to fit in a tweet, but like maybe write it in your notes or maybe post a little thing on Medium. And then if you can, just share that. Uh, and if you don't want to like it to influence like your social stream, it doesn't fit with whatever your regular social stream is, create a little throwaway Twitter account to post. But I think that it's a really good idea to, to let people know what you're thinking about and what's motivating you. Like, think about it, write it down, take a screenshot of your notes, post it on Twitter, use a hashtag like VidCon Australia, VidCon AUS, and then another hashtag like why I make stuff. Hashtag why I make stuff. And post that. And look at what other people are posting. Look what other people are saying. Uh, look at what, and think about what you're saying. And maybe find some other people who might have similar motivations to you and talk to you. Talk to them, connect with them, because I'm going to say this, even though I probably shouldn't, because I think all year about how to provide value with this conference, but I know for a fact that the most valuable thing in this room is you. And connecting with other creators is the actual, like, part of the main value that is created by these events like this. So, like, VidCon's value is you. Um, so, don't let that go by, because I know that I could not have done this 
If I didn't have my brother to talk to all the time about like crises, economic crises, existential crises, creative crises, it's so wonderful to have a guy, a uh, smart and passionate guy like my brother to talk to about that stuff. Um, so, do your best to find people to work that stuff out with, whether that's people in your lives that you love or fellow creators that you're connecting with, and I hope that VidCon can be a part of that connection, um, because I do not know anybody who does this alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Tom had his joke backstage. I was like, please stay on stage. So it was terrible. Say it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll say it. I'll say it. Big name's Hank. Hank. That's the joke. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> guys, I was just thinking, listening to Hank just then, how much more engaging is an American accent? Absolutely. Like, that was like. He was a very smart guy. He's like at one stage of the spectrum and yeah. we're at the other. It's yeah. Well, like, I mean, this is the band. It's like, is that guy from like. Rural Australia. No one probably understands what I mean. So no, everyone has no idea what's happening. Okay, good. At least we're all on the same page then. So we're setting up the piano for your recital. Yes, yes. But before that, okay. before my recital, we're going to get someone else out on stage next. So, is anyone here heard of Axis of Awesome? <laughs> yeah. What a band. What a cool name for a band. That's great. We, the what? Roundabout Crew sucks. We blew it. We bombed it with the Roundabout Crew. Yeah, we blew it. Sh absolutely. A bad name. So he's the musical one, this, this next guy. He's the, he's the musical one for the Australian based group, The Axis of Orson. And can I just say that on, on the way in, um, if anyone flew in, the distance from Melbourne Airport to Melbourne is longer than the flight from Sydney to Melbourne. <laughs> it's the longest car it's ride in the world. It's pretty cool, to be honest. And Kenny was lucky enough to ride the car with this guy. How the hell was the ride in? Well, we called it the Uber of Orson. Oh, oh that was just real clever. I guess they, that's why they call it Sin City. That's a hang of a joke. Okay, so, so he's here tonight to share his talents, creativity, and to perform a live set. Wow. Did you guys think you were getting music? Because you are. I'm so excited. They look riveted. There's a lot of cool From things. his human jukebox series, Mr. Benny Davis. Woo! something a little different. I suppose everybody, if you know me, you know me from the Axis of Awesome. Um, I wanted to take this a little bit more old school, do something that I did before the Axis of Awesome, something that I used to do out on the streets uh, for quite a few years when I first graduated university. See, I studied classical music, um, which is why I didn't have a job. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I would uh, go out to street corners and I'm about to do something for you that I used to do out there for quite a few years. Uh, so without further ado, would anybody like to buy some ecstasy? Usually I'll just see some perhaps see me afterwards. No, no I don't. No, I don't. Um, I don't sell ecstasy. Uh, I, I know where to get it. You need a number. Just, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Actually, uh, I've been working on some solo stuff lately, and uh, I was going to perform something uh, from my solo album that's going to be coming out soon. Um, something a little bit more sincere than what you're used to, so I hope you enjoy this. This is a song about, um, there's this cafe I go to every day in Sydney, and um, I always see this girl there, and I, I feel like everybody, guys and girls, we always feel these things that we really want to say. And there's things that hold us back from saying it, and I think it's important to just find a way to say it. Hey, pretty girl, sitting there by yourself in this cafe all the time. Breaks my heart to see you alone, girl, you know it is a crime. The way you linger on your coffee, and sip it so sweet and slow. It drives me crazy, so I gotta let you know. You're taking up a table with four seats And you're only using one You could have sat up at the bar What you're doing's kinda dumb Cause there's clearly no one with you You're not having anything to eat And my girlfriend and I are waiting for receipts What a twist, I've got a girlfriend If I were you, I'd sick of Oh, this would be a different song But I'm not Screenplay there. <laughs> my 
must be sad being on your own But I don't care songs to go fuck yourself to. <laughs> um, if anyone can think of a better title for me, please let me know, because album's dropping next week, and that's just a joke, but if I don't think of something good, I'm going to call my album that. <laughs> See how that affects sales. Um, uh, now, I'm genuinely going to leave you with something a little bit more sincere now. Um, this is just... Uh, you, you want more cynicism? And... Yeah. It doesn't really feel like the whole vibe. We've had a really positive energy going through this show about being true to yourself and safe spaces, and then I come out with the whole, hey, don't take up any more room than you're meant to. So I'm gonna leave you with something a bit nicer. Um, this is just a cover. Um, I do love the platform that uh, YouTube's created for people to make music and just, and even if they don't write, to be able to perform and do covers. I love it when it's changed a little bit. Um, this doesn't need an introduction, you know the tune. Uh, I got a video of this coming out in a couple of weeks, so hope you dig it. Her eyes, her eyes make the stars look like their night shine. Her hair, her hair falls perfectly without her chain. She's so beautiful, and I tell her every day.
he was serenading me. Yeah. And I got chills. I heard that. I heard that. You were I getting really chilled, man. Yeah. I was just shaking backstage. <laughs> Our next guest uh, is a food scientist and celebrity chef whose unique wild uh, creative desserts have attracted 3.2 million subscribers oh, and wow. half a billion uh, views on YouTube. Half a what? Half a billion. Half a billion? We need some of those views. Yeah. Yeah. Half, yeah. Yeah. Do you mind sharing some of those views? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> About half a billion more than us, so she, you know she's good. Uh, recently noticed the world's best online chef and taste awards. Her amazing culinary creations have appeared on hundreds of TV shows, websites, newspapers, and every social media platform. Let's give a huge hand to Anne Reardon. Coming up with ideas and then going and buying everything you need to make that idea a reality, whether that be cameras or in my case ingredients, and then actually filming it all and then editing it all. I know my videos take a long time to make because if you're making a 3D cake you've got to bake it and let it cool to start and then you've got to actually got to make it look good and change. I film myself so I've got to move the camera and focus it and change the lighting every time I'm doing something as well obviously as many of you would film yourselves. Um, so we have this tendency as creators to overwork. So I do once a week but I've met many creators who have easier videos to produce so instead of doing once a week they do twice a week or three times a week, or as one guy I met just last week, twice a day. I have no idea how he maintains that upload schedule, but that is huge. For those of you who have never heard of me and never heard of my channel, because most of my audience is in the US, which I think would be pretty the same as most of yours, here's a quick snippet of what my channel is about. It will play. I'm going to give it, there we go. We do need sound though. Because I can't sing like the last guy. <laughs> we just need him back on stage. You'll have to have it with no sound. So we have giant Ferrero Rochers, 3D cakes, chocolate, that seven kilos of chocolate is pop out, Instagram cakes, all sorts of cool stuff. Giant Magnum ice cream, that was fun to invite people over to eat, chocolate tools and chocolate desserts, all of that sort of thing. So that was supposed to have music, but anyway. <laughs> I do, but I know that all of you work hard creating your content. And then you upload it, and then you press that magical button that says public. And when you do that, it's like entering your creation that you've spent hours planning, filming, making into a race. And sometimes that race can seem really unfair because you can look to your left and see another video that you think it doesn't look like they tried anywhere near as hard as I did and their views are just going crazy. Has anyone had that experience before? And it's like they're on a travelator in their lane and you're running on gravel. And then likewise, you can see another video, you go, that's an awesome video. Why does this video not have more views? And it's like they're on a treadmill. It doesn't matter how fast they run, they're not getting views. But we're all in this race trying to get more views. And over this weekend, probably this morning already, some of you have been to panels on how to hack the algorithm. I'm pretty sure if you knew how to hack it, you wouldn't be talking, you'd just have a million views yourself on every video. But anyway, <laughs> still go to them. You're gonna be going to sessions saying how to get your videos into the travel and lane. And often as creators, we just think, okay, I'm gonna do more work, I'll spend more time on my video, I'll spend more time editing it better or filming it better or spend more money on it and I'll do more because that's going to result in more. And so then we just overwork. So I'm going to tell you the opposite of everyone else. I'm going to say just take a step back and just take some time out for yourself because it's, research has shown that a rested brain is more creative. And if you can come up with more creative ideas, then when people find your content, they're more likely to love it. So take the time to do what refreshes you. Don't just neglect your friendships because they say, can you come out? And you go, no, I've got to edit. So no, I can't. Make sure you actually have time in your week that you can spend time with friends. Time in your week that you can spend time with your family 
And if you've got a partner, like I've got a husband, we have a date night on Saturday night, invest into your relationships. Don't neglect all of that. If you have a faith, don't neglect that either. We go to church every Sunday, whether I'm going to produce a video or not, whether I'm behind or not, because that's something that's building in to us. So if you've got things in your life that you're allowing to build in, schedule in your time so that you can actually keep creating and coming up with creative ideas, then you'll be able to keep going. So we haven't missed a Friday upload in five and a half years. And you can't do that if you're not allowing time to build into yourself. So if you heard nothing else of what I said, I want you to remember this and write it down. You are more valuable than your view count. Thank you. Because that food looked amazing. That made me hungry. I was, I was hungry. Man. I was kind of hoping she was going to do one of those things they do on the Today Show where they bring up the thing and start cooking. <laughs> yeah. And get some of that strong oh, enough. This is just for the MCs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. It's still good. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I'm <laughs> Our next performer is awesome. He does dance tutorials, does some. He's a good friend of the choreographs as well, yeah. Choreographs and dances? Does he? Yeah, like, we do that sometimes. We do! Oh, do that dance you choreographed. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, give me a little dance. Who's this? Yeah, let's just get one. Alright, let's go. All right, if you guys good. could get, like, a steady clap. So Jamie Rodriguez, hey, even me, even Kenny, especially Kenny to be honest. Jamie Rodriguez does dance tutorials, choreographs dances, he's got over 270 million views, which is heaps. That's like heaps more than us. Yeah, <laughs> again, it seems to be a recurring theme. That's a theme. <laughs> anyway, we see him at all the events and he's a top dude. We love him to bits. Yeah. Jamie Rodriguez. You! <laughs> Well done on the dance moves, by the way. Well done. G'day everyone, how you going? Are you having a great VidCon? Now my name is uh, Jaden Rodriguez. I know it's the most Aussiest name ever, uh, but I am a, uh, an Aussie creator. Um, I'm sure a lot of you don't know who I am. I have a dance channel like The Voice said before. I upload some basic dance videos online for anyone to learn whether they know how to dance or they've never danced before. So if you want to learn to dance, go for it. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some struggles that I've had on YouTube. You see, uh, now uh, my channel is just purely dedicated to just uploading dance videos. Even though I've tried to upload, you know, like, I guess challenges and, uh, and uh, like singing tutorials, oh, sorry, singing covers, because I sing as well, but for some reason on my channel people are just like, nah, just stick to the dance and we, we only hear because you dance. So they're not really interested in what else I do. And that's, you know, it, it's, it's a struggle because to sing as well, and, and I want to showcase that as well. Uh, so I decided to start a secondary channel, but in this day and age of YouTube, everyone's doing it, and it's, it's almost like, how am I going to stand out and be different? And um, I wanted this channel to be really, really different, so I uh, was talking to a couple of creators that I knew, and I decided to, you know, maybe we should do a collab channel, uh, and maybe we upload weekly, uh, and we can maybe be four of us so we do it together so we can share the load. Uh, by the way, these boys that I collab with are from different parts of the world and I have never met them before. So one guy lives in Italy, the other one in LA, and the other one in the Netherlands. And the idea is that when we hit 400,000 followers, we're gonna meet for the first time. And uh, I know it may sound a little bit confusing, but we started this at the beginning of the year. So instead of explaining it to you, how about I show you? One, two, three. For the first time ever, four YouTubers around the world will form an epic band. These guys from Australia, Italy, the Netherlands, and the USA have never met each other. This is Continuum. The mooie is like to have a You don't have to have you well what up to know. You don't have to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Ho 
online boy band na Petenio. Oh, 
I'm not ordering. You're the daughter. Is this a prank? Or do you come to the window? Genevieve, why are you standing? I feel like standing. What about you, Cobra? You uh, like to wrap the old laughing gear around a couple of frothies? What? They keep their beers cold by putting them in an ASCII. You taking the Batman villain? Some up flyer. Hey, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. That is bigger than what I thought it would be. I was looking up to the rear vision mirror, and there is not one there. The big <laughs> Get out of instant of tears and move on to the next episode. The world is waiting for us to fail. The pressure is overwhelming. I can't breathe. <laughs> I actually can't breathe. Are you really going to do this? Just going to pretend that nothing happened? Do you think we'll get to a point where people want to edit their genes? I know two people who've already done gene therapies on themselves. I'm so divine. I'm so divine. This little filly's got a busy mouth, hasn't she, Colonel? Yes. Ah, good. That's very good distance. Okay. Let's go. Has your vagina ever come to life and talk to you? Sir Walsh? the invoices usually on time. A few familiar shows in there? So I'm Mike, I'm from Screen Australia, we fund stuff. Uh, it's all about helping create sustainable careers for creators. Um, I also run our Skip Ahead program with Google to support creators to grow their YouTube audience. So when VidCon asked me to do a keynote, uh, I said I'd be a fraud, I'm not a creator, I'm a dull bureaucrat. Uh, but they persisted, they thought I might have something of interest that I could share with you folks, so my ego refused to let me say no. Uh, thanks to my role, for the past 12 years I've had an overview of what's happening with creators and audiences. I see patterns, and one of the main patterns that I see is that good things happen to creators with large, engaged audiences. It might be stating the obvious, but let me dip into it a bit. They get interest from the film and TV industry, they attract marketing money and get to make branded content, they get to sell merchandise, uh, but the big audience came first and they did all that themselves. All the creators I know with big audiences have one thing in common. They didn't wait for anyone's permission to upload their videos, they didn't wait for anyone's money, they just worked hard at it and that big audience rarely comes overnight. They grow over years and years of consistent hard work and effort. You are in control of building that engaged audience and that engaged audience gives you power which means you are entirely in control of your own destiny. That's all I wanted to share with you, that you're in control, simple as that. Your future success is up to you and how much work you're willing to put in. Uh, even though, um, uh, so I've met a lot of people who want to be on TV, unsurprisingly. Um, it's really hard, it's really hard to get a meeting with a serious TV exec. It's hard to prepare a really compelling pitch for them. Uh, it's an art in itself, just creating a series bible, and then there's never just one executive to get through. You might impress one, but they might have to pitch it to their colleagues. Uh, people question themselves. I find this funny, but maybe no one else will, they'll think. And different people have different opinions and can easily get talked out of it or overruled. So you are, in some ways, at the mercy of whatever that broadcaster or distributor might be looking for at that time. Uh, which you might have no idea about. Most broadcasters are naturally conservative and have to lean towards what they think the most number of people will watch because TV is generally a numbers game where they only make money if people are watching. So consequently, I don't think there's been a particularly inclusive, it's not been a particularly inclusive industry. I don't think we've seen a lot of people from diverse backgrounds or underrepresented groups making it to the screen. For them, the traditional road is even harder. With all this working against you, it doesn't sound like you have much control, but you do. You have all the tools at your fingertips to make content that reflects you and your potential, and you can go out and find your own audience. Uh, there's an example of, uh, I was pitched a series that had already been pitched to a bunch of broadcasters and been turned down. 
Um, I funded it for the creators to, to release it themselves and over a weekend it went gangbusters, it got a million views and uh, within two days I had a, a senior exec from a broadcaster calling me and ready to bang down the door to support them. And this is a broadcaster, an executive who'd already been pitched the show and the difference was the audience. Um, once he'd seen that it had an audience, uh, it just absolutely got him over the line. Um, the show had proven itself and uh, if you have an audience it takes away the risks for people who need content. They don't have to second guess their own tastes. If they like it but no one else has seen it yet then it's just their subjective opinion. And that means sticking your neck out to say that it's good and it can be frightening to stick your neck out. If something has an audience they can say it's objectively good. They know that other people like it. They don't have to expose their own opinions to represent the creators to their seniors. That's how shallow those executives are. Just a few, more, a few other examples um, for people for whom this has worked, like uh, John Luck, also known as Mike Shoney, getting cast in a feature film in soccer. Um, uh, my phone rang off the hook after the first season of The Catering Show came out, and they got commissioned to a second season on the ABC. Uh, Foxtel are investing big in content creators. They've got a, a sketch series coming up called The Slot, um, which will be a prime time show. Uh, Derek from Veritasium got to host a major documentary series here. Uh, and the Raka Raka, that you know, fantastic lads, they get constantly flown around the world, uh, promote movies and TV shows, and sketchy are on more billboards than they can count. If you can build an audience, it makes you like a magnet for people in broadcasting or feature film production or financing of any kind. It says this person knows how to entertain their audience. This makes life so much easier for an executive. They know people like watching them, they don't need to question it the same way. You're making it much easier for them to take a chance on diverse talent. They all want to, because it takes out some of their perceived risk, which we all know is bullshit anyway, by the way. They need to program what they think people will watch, and if they already know that people watch you, it makes those businesses and business decisions that much easier. Another benefit of your views, of course, is the data that it creates. You can paint a picture for them about who watches your show, what age they are, where they hang out, what else they like. It's very useful information for broadcasters. Uh, but don't get me wrong, people still have their own opinions, unfortunately. Um, people aren't so entirely superficial that they'll be purely swayed by metrics. You have to have some substance to back it up, but you're all making good videos with substance, right? Two, three people are, awesome. Hard work plus substance equals views, and views equals a career. Um, I know a lot of my examples are about superficial things, like getting into TV, but uh, you know, you can also use these powers, this audience, to, to change the world. You know, my good friends, the Van Buren brothers, they released a clip the other day, uh, pro gay marriage, and the last time I looked, after three days, it had 3.5 million views. So you can use that power to, to make change and uh, to advance a good cause that you believe in. You're entirely in control of finding and engaging your audience. Finding that audience gives you power and control over your own destiny. I love that quote. Uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I don't think it's a coincidence that it was made by a film producer, Samuel Goldwyn, the G in MGM. So, go work hard and see how lucky it makes you. That's me. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
She is without doubt one of YouTube Australia's most talented up and coming singer slash songwriters. Double threat. Well, double double threat. threat. You know what they say. Uh, her colourful personality shines through in performances of her original songwriting and some of the world's most popular songs that have been stamped with her own creative soul and transformed to be truly her own. She was getting pretty loose at the party last year. Well, I know she's got a bit of a hangover. Uh, I know she's still got a voice. <laughs> Introducing and please welcome Demi Lou Chevelle. Yeah. Thank you. 
And if they were, they were kind of boring. It would be like the girlfriend or like the girl that tells the guys off for having so much fun. Um, and we kind of got really bored of that. And so we decided to form a comedy group and we decided to start writing and making our own content. And so that was kind of my first experience of moving outside of the label of just actress. Because um, not only was I writing and producing and creating my own content, I was also moving outside of that label in terms of like the roles that I was playing. They weren't the traditional roles that women would play on screen. And so we started out doing YouTube videos and then we moved into making some sketches for the ABC, for television. Around the same time, we started directing as well. So I was now writing, producing, acting, directing on YouTube for TV. We started doing live shows and then eventually we got our television series, um, which is called Where Man Thank You Ma'am. It was a six episode series that aired here on ABC, on ABC iView, um, and it was also screened in America on a network over there. Um, and then so kind of from that, you know, again, I was expanding that list of these labels, right? So I was like now kind of show running a show and then on top of that we were doing live shows and then now I start doing things like directing commercials and so I'm kind of doing all of these things and it's amazing and I love it. I have like a dream job. I love what I do so much. But it's caused this kind of very specific social anxiety around social situations and whenever this happens, it strikes a particular fear in my heart. And it's when people ask me the question, so Sarah, what do you do? Who here hates that question? I hate it, I hate it so much because I never know how to answer. Like I've just told you all of the things I do. I just, I never know how to answer people. And so I kind of like try and make it easy. I just pick a few. I'm like, oh, I'm like an actress and a writer and a director. And then people always follow up with this next question. They go, yeah, but which one do you like the best? And I just feel like I actually do like 20 things and I was trying to make it easier by like whittling it down to three and you're just like breaking my balls. And so I go, well, you know, I give them the honest answer. I'm like, I actually like all of them. And then they come up with the next question that always follows. Yeah, but if you had to pick one, and now when I get asked that question, like I just really feel like responding to them. Do you like pizza and burgers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like, which one do you prefer? Like if you had to pick one, like if you're serious, you should pick one and commit to eating that for the rest of your life. It's ridiculous and I feel like these labels are kind of the problem with the world. I feel like so many of our problems stem from this fact that we get lazy and we want to just label people. We want to label them by race. We want to label them by gender. We want to label them by sexuality. And it's just a way to kind of like easily decipher who people are, right? So we don't really actually have to think about them. We don't really have to take the time to get to know them as people. And I think it's messed up. And I was thinking about this last night. I was watching the AFL because I'm in Melbourne and that's what we do, right? Uh, so I was watching the AFL and I was like, can you imagine what it would be like if the players are like playing the game and they're trying to score a goal and they have to like stop and explain to people the rules of the game, who they are, what role they're playing, what like their job is in trying to get the goal. Like they don't do that. Like, Joel Selwood, the captain of Geelong, is not standing around explaining his existence to people. He's just focused on doing what he came here to do, which is being in the game and kicking goals. Not as many as I would have liked last night because they lost, but still, you know, that's irrelevant. And anyway, that's kind of how I feel like what it's like as a creator. Like, every second that you stop to explain to people what you do, to explain to them the YouTube thing, try and explain all these different roles that we do, that's the second that you could be actually creating shit and kicking goals, which is what you came here to do. So I just feel like screw the labels, focus on kicking goals, 
Because at the end of the day, when you're kicking goals, that's all people see. Like, they're not going to ask you those questions. They're not going to worry about that. They're just going to, like, see the goal and they want to jump on that. And yeah, that's kind of what I have to say. Focus on kicking the goals. Don't worry about explaining to, to people what you do. They're going to catch up. Just go out there and do what you love and the rest will follow. Thanks for listening. She's an excellent public speaker. She was really good. She, she, was really good. she did things with her hands up, just being like stiff and kind of freaking out. Like, what, do I, what do I do? We, we did robot for a bit. Yeah, we did. Man, we no, she was an excellent, excellent speaker. Now, our next guest, uh, who has, she has the same name as our last guest. What are the odds? That's weird. They should have spaced that out. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's about that. So you. she's a Melbourne-based singer slash songwriter. Again, how much talent is on YouTube? So much talent. So Why don't we get any? Uh, best known for her covers, and I'm not talking about her bed covers, I'm doing cover. In particular, the cup song of Royals. Anyone familiar with Lord that Royals? That's a, that's a good video, you guys should watch that. It's a great Does anyone want to hear Kenny sing Royals? No. <laughs> He's the most tone deaf man in the world. That, that video amassed over 12 million views. So she is now working on original music. And she was recently featured as an artist on The Voice. I oh, know, she met Seal and shit. Right. Have you yes. seen Seal? He's a cool dude. He is a cool dude. dude. He's a cool cat. <laughs> Please welcome Sarah Snow. Woo, Sarah. Go, Sarah. this kind of creative 
outlet of taking something that inspires you, making it your own, and just finding a unique way to connect with people. So doing this, this was probably by far one of the most complex videos I did. Um, but yeah, I loved it and I loved that response. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I think it's so important now on YouTube because it is becoming an extremely clustered space. There's so much content, especially a lot of, I would say, a lot of people doing very similar stuff and it's important to be unique and to find a niche that people really enjoy and connect with them on that level. So for me, doing cover music, in a way it is duplicating music, but it's finding my own way to connect with people. And that's the reason I love YouTube. As, as The Voice said as well, I recently did The Voice, which I loved. It was an amazing experience. But I was out of my creative control. It was someone else had the reins, and that was quite scary because I had no idea how I was going to be perceived by other people. And yeah, I just, I, it was quite a daunting process and experience. And coming from being in my bedroom making these covers and being able to connect with you guys on such a close way, I, I really appreciate that connection. So when I got let out into the world in front of Australia on national television, it was terrifying because I loved being in my safe space. Um, but that seems to be a really current, current theme with today. It's, it's taking risks and not being afraid to put yourself out there and, and try something different. Because that's where I've kind of found what I really enjoy, by taking a simple idea and spinning it on its head. So yeah, from that whole experience, I definitely walked away um, just feeling really inspired to be different. And um, yeah, that's like me, I guess, on my path of creating original content and starting to write songs. And YouTube's been an amazing platform to allow me to connect with people with original music as well. So I'm in the process of getting my original music out. So hopefully some of you guys might listen to it one day, which is kind of exciting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just amazing, I guess, to see how music and YouTube have connected. Because I used to just be a fan. I used to make YouTube videos, sorry, watch YouTubers. And then all of a sudden I decided, you know what, I'm going to take the risk and I'm, I'm going to make a YouTube video. And I think once you take that leap of faith and you start creating content. I think at first as well, um, I just wanted to make content, I guess, to impress other people and, and to make other people happy. But when I started to make content for myself and started to make myself happy, that's when I just fell in love with making YouTube content. So yeah, I would definitely say that the things that have inspired me to be a YouTuber is, is seeing the support from the community and being a Melbourne-based YouTuber, like many people that have spoken today, I'm very proud to see how many of you guys have turned out to support the YouTube community. Because, um, yeah, we, we are growing and it's, it's so impressive and I love that. Um, yeah, and I think if I could leave you guys with any advice, I would definitely just say find something that really passion, that you're passionate about and really drives you and fuels you and find a way to make it your own. Because as I said, it's a very congested platform these days. Like you're trying to do what everyone else is doing, it's not going to work. So find a way to make it completely your own. People will fall in love with you and your content. Thank you guys so much. I'm seriously. No matter how hard I'm trying to. Very well done. I'll tell you what, if the voice had a layout up on stage, she would have smashed it. Absolutely, it would have been a landslide. She would have won it hands down on the cup. On the cup. <laughs> Our next speaker is a fangirl turned entertainer who posts story videos embracing a straightforward, awkwardly personal humour. From Uber drivers, uncomfortable therapy sessions, psycho roommates, and harrowing bad dates. Haven't we all been there? Uh, have you been there? What's your worst date? Oh, you've had a bad date. Well, okay, worst date, probably. Uh, Actually, yeah, took this lovely lady out to the Easter show. Uh, I had this uh, great vision of myself winning a, uh, a giant stuffed teddy bear. I'm thinking, Kenny, you bloody charmer. This is going to be the best day ever. That's what every man dreams uh, of. One of the first things we do is go on, on the rides. Unfortunately, she felt a little bit queasy and threw up. Oh. On herself or on you? On both of us. <laughs> which uh, yeah, That's which ended the day pretty quickly. That was a bit of a train wreck. Second day? No second day, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, there's a bit of advice for you all out there. Don't throw up on the day. That's good advice. <laughs>
Well, our next guest exposes situations like that for all the world to see. Please welcome The Gabby Show. <laughs> restricted content on YouTube. See, you're the ones messing up my analytics. Your parents take them home, take away their fidget spinners. They need to learn a lesson in honesty. But I love places like this. I love conventions like this because I feel like this is the only place where people really understand us. Because out in the real world, it's completely different. Like, here's a really good example. In the real world, people get excited about things like babies and engagements. But in our world, people get excited about things like Baby Ariel and their Twitter engagement. No one. Okay, great. <laughs> but it's, it's just really weird seeing different lifestyles. Like my sister, she's only a year older than me, and she has two babies and a husband. I have two therapists and a stolen Netflix account. So it's <laughs> day and night with us. Our conversation's always under the phone with her being like, hey, I gotta go, I gotta make dinner and feed the baby. And I'm like, yeah, me too, I gotta go make a musically and feed my ego. But here, people get it, they understand it, because, you know, we're not making our friends based on proximity or who's in our class alphabetically. Here, we can hand select our friends from an entire universe of people based on whatever it is that we're interested in. It's the globalization of friendship, and it's truly incredible. It's like we're the misfits who found each other because we don't really belong anywhere else, or at least that's my experience. You know, growing up, I, I didn't really have that many friends, but I sat on AOL Instant Messenger, just aged myself to all the people under, age, under 18 here, but I was on AOL Instant Messenger, and I would talk to strangers and tell them my deepest secrets to a faceless username and just throw it into the dark cobwebs of the internet, and it's really scary to think about, but I would sit there for hours, you know, just lost in cyberspace, but I've always felt comfortable tangled up in the World Wide Web. I felt safe. But I spent so much time talking to strangers about my problems on the internet that I forgot how to deal with them in real life. And I became so content with my internet connection that I stopped working on my interpersonal connections. I became so comfortable with X and O that I shied away from hugs and kisses. And it became really lonely. And I started becoming forever alone in a crowded room. And I had friends, and it just always felt like I was on the outside looking in, kind of like they were the earth, and I was a satellite, just kind of looking down at them, if that makes sense. Not down, that's not an awful, they're better than you, trust me. <laughs> but it became really lonely, and because of this, I spent a lot of time sobbing silently in pillows when I should have been talking to people. And I started drowning in depression, and most of my adult life, I was suffering silently, and crippled by anxiety because I didn't know how to talk about it anymore. And it's a sad life because you can feel so connected to so many people, yet still feel so alone. And I talked a lot about this with my therapist, and he asked me, did you ever tell your friends about this? Have you ever explained your feelings? I was like, God, of course not. And he said, well, why not? That's what friends are for. What, did you ever explain to them your feelings? of darkness and loneliness. I said, no, God, no. And he asked me why, and I said, because they couldn't understand. How could they? They're all so happy. They all live these beautiful Midwestern lives. They could never get it. And I was alienating, alienating myself by living this digital world and separating myself, myself from them. So recently, I found myself, and it wasn't that long ago, in one of the darkest places that I've been in a very long time. It was this very strange conundrum of feeling like my chest was so full that I was going to explode and somehow feeling completely empty at the same time. But if anybody ever asked me, are you okay? I would say, yes, of course, I'm okay. So on the 4th of July, which was very recently actually, I forced myself to go out and I told myself, Gabby, you have an incredible life because truly I do. You have an incredible life. Go out, spend time with your friends, get a tan, have a couple drinks, and it's going to be amazing, and you're going to have a great time. And I did, and it worked for a couple hours. But then as the sun went down, the darkness grew, 
and I started feeling that time bomb in my chest start ticking again. And my instinct has always been to hide. I've always wanted to run. I've always hid from my emotions. I've always run to the bathroom and cried instead of letting anybody see it. And that was my instinct. But I just didn't want to anymore. I was just so tired. And hide and seek is only fun if somebody's looking. So on the 4th of July, I'm looking around and I'm feeling these really heavy emotions and my instinct is to run. And for some reason, I just didn't want to. I didn't have the energy, I didn't have the strength. And I looked around at my friends and everybody was so happy and absorbed in their own moment and enjoying it so much that I just decided to sit down and just feel the pain and just let everybody do their own thing. And I sat up against the wall and all my friends are watching the fireworks and nobody noticed. And I sat there for what could have been five minutes or what could have been an hour until one girl noticed. And this girl, I don't really have a relationship with her. She actually used to bash me on the internet and to my friends before she met me in person. And we met, and it was cordial, but we didn't really have anything in common. And she wasn't anybody that I would ever see myself opening up to. And she saw that I was feeling upset. And she came over to me and she kneeled in front of me. And I was like, God, here we go. She's gonna ask me if I'm okay and I don't wanna talk about it. But she didn't. She said, I can't imagine the pressure you're under. And I have no idea what's hurting you but it's going to be okay. And then she put her arm around me and I just surprised myself because I allowed myself to sob into this girl who not only did I expect to never even have small talk with, but I'm ripped open and bleeding out in front of her and she's just silently holding me, not asking questions and comforting me and until I caught my breath and then I'd be pulled back and I looked around and still nobody noticed. And I learned a lot that night. And I've changed a lot since that night. And the first thing I learned was that it's okay to feel. And it's okay to feel bad things. And it's okay to hurt. It's okay to be sad. And the second thing I learned is it's okay to let people know. You don't have to put on a front. It's okay to tell people yeah, you're not okay. Take a step outside of your digital you and just be vulnerable. And it is so scary, horrifying to be that vulnerable, but when you do it, it is so empowering. There is nothing more empowering than just owning your emotions. Hide and seek isn't fun if nobody is looking, but sometimes you have to ask somebody to play with you. Since that day, I've started opening up about things that I never thought I would open up with and with the people I never thought could ever understand that I would talk to, and I was dumbfounded by who and how many people shared my exact experience, my exact upbringing, my pain, my emotions, my fears, my insecurities. These people who I never expected to understand walked a marathon in my shoes, and I didn't know because I didn't ask. But the next time somebody asked me, are you okay? I said, no, but I will be. And I hope you can answer the same. Thank you guys. That's a great message that uh, Gabby's just conveyed. It's always a fantastic thing to ask someone if they're okay. Asking any of your mates, asking anyone if they're okay is always so important. But an American accent, man. It's good. That oh, was a good one. Oh, 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 sorry, bro. I feel like I'm in Hollywood, California. Oh, look at the chase on the couch. Oh, chase couch. played this before. Yeah, that, that accent is just, uh, that, that was really, really engaging stuff. And, uh, so, we apologize if we're a little bit rattled today. Go to these events and they go, come down, have a few drinks, enjoy yourself, and we have all the drinks. We woke, we woke up in a state this morning and went to our meet and greet, and there was these huge lines, and there was our line, and it was fun. We were rattled though. And our next guest actually, um, I went to this event, it was a YouTube hosted event, drank all the beers, and we're walking down the street, I think we were getting an Uber, I don't know what we were doing, and she gave us a lift. So that's really? the type of person she is. She gave us a lift. We, she had to put up with our banter for like a whole car ride. Oh, man. Has she ever given you a lift since? So I, I thought she was going to swerve off the road and just <laughs> do us all a favor. But no, she was very kind. And she's known for entrusting her fans and having a lot of fans. And she's had over 200 million video views, which is massive. And 900,000 in the last month, which is absolutely wow. insane. Wow. So. 
She'll be coming on stage with Kristen Bowen, the head of top creators at YouTube, and then she's going to have a little chat on the couches. And hopefully the couches don't chase her around. Let's get on stage then, Tom. Wendy and Kristen Wendy. Bowen. Wendy. Kristen Bowen. <laughs>
definitely had a different perspective in life. Everything was happier, and I'm like, I literally just changed my like lifestyle routine. Like it wasn't anything to do with you know what was affecting me or happening to me, great things or bad things. It was just my body responding to the bad lifestyle that resulted in me feeling really, really down. And I think a lot of YouTubers do this and may not realize maybe it has something to do with your lifestyle and your health as well. Yeah, thank you. And we're so glad that you fixed that. Yes. Um, and another thing that I think that you, you've talked a bit about, you know, um, some of the kind of reframing that you've done to try to look at things with a bit more optimism and positivity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, YouTube can be a little bit of an emotional roller coaster where one day you, you're getting millions of views on a video, maybe the next video you don't. How do you kind of, you know, deal with some of those emotional fluctuations and seeing things in a positive light? Uh, for me, I know every YouTuber is like, algorithm, like how many views are we gonna get this week? And being on YouTube for so long, like, it is an emotional roller coaster. Not only do you have to look at the comments, first of all, um, the thing is like your views can be a million this week and then like 100,000 the next week and you don't even know. So for me, it's about thinking of it as like a challenge. Like I don't like to um, think of, you know, I like to think about what I can control. And like, I mean, it's really great to, um, it feels very comfortable to be able to complain about something and to say, you know, it's happening to me. But that wasn't very helpful with what I was doing, so it was definitely going on a journey and rethinking that process, maybe making it into a game. Okay, so this week wasn't so well, didn't go so well, how can I improve it and use it as a learning experience and experience to grow versus an excuse to say, hey, I'm not doing well because this is happening to me. And I feel like the success for my channel that a lot of people ask is like my ability to push through by simply reframing the way something happens. I mean, it's easy, much easier and I have done it. Like, I have complained about, hey, you know, you know, YouTube algorithms again, this is why I'm not getting views, as opposed to looking more inward and going, okay, what can I control? I can control the kind of content I make. Let's just make better content and see how that goes next week. So yeah, that's definitely helped me push through with a lot more of a positive mindset. And like, that's something you guys can look at as well when creating your videos and your channel, instead of, yeah, just look at what else can I control and what I can do to improve that. So true for life beyond the YouTube videos as well, right? Like yeah. focusing on the things that you can control as opposed to everything else, I like that. So, I mean, you've skyrocketed into fame. You have so many millions of fans all around the world. How do you deal with the attention that you get from fans and, you know, kind of having a private life as well? Oh, I think privacy goes out the door when you join YouTube, by the way. Just, just saying. Um, I think it's kind of weird at first because um, I never did YouTube for the fame. I didn't go to YouTube going, I want to be famous. I just want to create. So this whole like fame thing is kind of weird to me and it always surprises me when I walk out the door and someone stops me and it's like, hey you, and I'm like, oh, hi. Um, like I love it when people come up to me. I love meeting the people that watch my videos and like seeing them in real life, hugging them. That's why I love things like this. Meeting greets are the best. Like literally, my viewers are the cutest thing in the world. Like every YouTuber will say that, but I think my viewers are the cutest people in the world. Um, but yeah, I think um, for me, the thing that makes me the most anxious though is that like when people stare, like I have to say, like staring, I'd rather you come up to me, say hi, take a photo, give me a hug. Um, the thing that makes me the most anxious when I go out is when like, like you're eating dinner, right? And then like someone's sitting like over there and they're just like, and then you see them like take out the phone, like is, is it this girl? And then like they stare. That makes me really uneasy. Um, and you do get like a bit used to it after a while. And I think for me, I just like to think about it this way. Like I've been given a responsibility um, considering I've got so many people looking up to me. And like, think about it this way. You can just go say hi, give a hug. And like that would make someone's day, you know? And it's so easy. So it's like, why not do it? So yeah. I, I kind of, I really like it. Like, yeah. That's so sweet. Okay, lesson for VidCon. If you see someone that you admire and you wanted to meet, go up and introduce yourself. Don't stare awkwardly from across the room. Yeah, yeah. Don't, okay. don't do the open stare. <laughs> Good tip. Um, you've been doing this for years now, and 
you know, I, I, I'm amazed by just how you keep coming up with new stuff and you know, how many life hacks can you come up with? You come up with so many ideas. Like, how do you stay creatively fresh and sort of balance what you want to make from a creative perspective versus what the audience is, is demanding? Like, is, is there a tension there or do those align? Um, for me, I've always loved making content people love to watch. Um, and I think there's always a very healthy way to combine the two things. A lot of people will always think it's like one or the other. You either make content for yourself or you either make content for other people. But I think it's um, not black or white. It's great. You can make both. Find you know a trend and spin it in a way that you like to make it. And for me, I always say I watch so much YouTube. Like literally, if I'm not making videos, I'm watching people's videos, and that really helps me creativity creatively because there are so much there's so much talent on YouTube. Everyone always has a great spin on something. So I think I consume YouTube content maybe at least like three to four hours a day. And I feel like that really helps keep me creatively fresh because you know when you hear like like a like a director, you want to watch more movies, you know? So if you're a YouTuber, it just makes sense to watch more YouTube and just to see everyone else's perspective and see, you know, learn things from them. Like you could learn from a channel that has 200 subscribers. I think that's like that's an awesome thing because they might have like a fresh perspective as opposed to that like always looking for people that have like big numbers. Like you can learn from anyone, and I think that's that's like how I stay creative. I love that, and I'd love to talk about self-esteem for a second because. I think that you're someone who is very sure of who they are and has like such a nice, good presence about them. Is, the, is self -esteem, having positive self-esteem something that ha you've had to work on or does that kind of just come naturally to you? Do you have any tips for how if anyone's struggling with that? Yeah, I think the first tip I have um, for everyone is just to own your weirdness. I think that took me a little, yay! <laughs> that took me a little while to like get. Like when I first started YouTube, like I got, um, I wasn't like super confident. I wasn't like yes, and I don't think anyone, not many people, do start YouTube because everyone is human. You know, we all have our insecurities. We all get worried about what people think of me. But my channel didn't start to grow until like I owned my weirdness. And like if you just like have a little bit of a look at like who who you admire and who you watch. You kind of know that they have their quirks about them and that's why you love them. And for me, like I was really lucky enough to have done a lot of really embarrassing things like growing up to the point where like this YouTube thing wasn't really like as much of a deal. Like I remember back in university um, for summer school, like I got, we got forced to dress all up in white, um, head to toe, go out to the city, and then stand in the most busiest corners and sing like Dancing Queen just to the just to the crowd. And like that's what we were forced to do. Like we went to every single popular place around the city and sang Dancing Queen. So um, like after experiences like that, I kind of feel like you know everything else kind of gets put into perspective. And if it's like something you are struggling with with self-confidence, just try and focus on why you're doing it. Like why why is it that you're making videos? Like do you want this life where you become a YouTuber? And if that is your dream, everything else should kind of like not be as important. And you really just gotta focus, like put things in priority, perspective, and just make sure you're just remembering why you do it. And that's why I think everyone says like start with why. Like figure out your why, stick it up on a wall, write it down, and every time it feels hard, it's challenging, just look back on that reason and be like, yeah, I remember, like, let's let's forget about everything else. This is this is why I'm doing it. Yes. I love that. Okay, I mean, anything else that you want to tell the, the group here tonight? Any kind of projects that you want to mention to people? Oh, I have one, but I kind of feel like I can't say this right oh, now. Top secret, okay. Mm, there is you're going to have to stay tuned. Yeah, so on September the 13th, I'm going to make an announcement. It is literally the coolest project I have done. So I can't talk about that right now, but let's just say um, I'm voicing a really cool character in a cartoon. Yeah, so that's a project I've been working on. It's really exciting, actually. So exciting, and we don't have to wait too long. No, just a couple, next Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. I think, yeah. So Perfect. voiceover. Yeah, I got some weird what? voices, you know? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Please help me thank Wenji for being here. Thank you, guys.
to Wendy and Kristen. Guys, thank you so much for coming to the first VidCon Australia crew at a keynote. We had a lot of fun. I hope you guys did too. We're in the roundabout crew. Thanks, uh, VidCon, for having us. This is awesome. Yeah. Thanks to YouTube. Thanks for Wendy for the lift home and just hang around. We'll need another one. <laughs> yeah. um, this, this, this has been awesome. This so. is some really cool stuff that uh, VidCon are doing in Australia. And the more support we get from you guys is that the, the more this is going to happen throughout the future. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks follow us on us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, Roundabout Crew. Uh, easy to spell. Uh, Snapchat, listen to, our, listen to our podcast as well. Guys, go and enjoy the rest of VidCon and we'll see you around. Enjoy. Thanks, Have guys. Right.